we are so grateful to have a preacher with us. I believe he's a prophet of the Lord. I have admired him for many, many years. Feel a deep respect and love for you, Brother Morgan. Many, many years, even going way back, listened to your tapes before I'd ever seen your face. And uh, your concepts and your preaching that has stirred our whole movement. He travels all over the world. He's a pastor. He's a superintendent of the Western District in California. And yet he and his wife have taken time to be with us at the anchor. The Bible says, how can you hear without a preacher? How can he preach except he be sent? He gives gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We've had evangelists with us, Brother Burns, for this is seven Sundays. Amen. Aren't we glad that he's here with us? He and I both felt he's labored here in the church in prayer and in word. Felt that he was supposed to be here this weekend because we've come with high expectations. And you have been a gift to our movement. You've been a gift to this church. But we believe that he's a gift right now for this hour. Would you welcome Brother Morgan as he comes to preach the word of the Lord? Amen. God bless you, Brother Morgan. Well, let's continue to clap and magnify our great God. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's good to be back in Zanesville. I must have really done bad the last time I was here. It took you nine years to get me back. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, but it is a delight to be here. And, uh, <clears throat> well, it's just, it's just good to be here. Amen. Uh, appreciate you being kind and understanding. My wife told me, she said, there's nothing in the Bible that you have to wear a tie. I said, I know, I know. She's, she's, you know, she's really a, a hippie. <laughs> we live in San Francisco. I think she'd move down to Haight-Ashbury if I let her, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I said, I know there's nothing in the Bible about wearing a tie, but, oh, you know, it's just, just want to, well, I'm going to leave that alone because that's a slippery slope right there. Amen. But anyway, I'm glad. So thank you for taking your ties off. I'm just glad I didn't lose my pants. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a good way to start here this morning. Amen. Praise God. Well, some of you are just like. You know. All right. I am honored to be at Zanesville, and it's good to be with Brother and Sister Bounds and this church. Brother Burns, amen. Honor you. And what a tremendous church and ministry of this church that's not just impacting this, this part of uh, Ohio, this region, but also it's impacting the world. We need to have a global impact. We need to have a global impact. Amen. And it's a delight to be here. And I'm glad to have my wife with me. She normally does not travel with me. She is the pastor of Abounding Grace in San Francisco. Matter of fact, Brother Tenney, here a while back, see me, and he and I is. Now, Brother Mark, I want to tell you right now, for God's sake, I used to tell this to Billy Cole. For God's sake, don't go home and mess your wife's church up. <laughs> I told him, I said, man, there's a lot of truth to that. He said, I know there's a lot of truth. That's why I'm telling you. I'm serious about it. And uh, I, I say this jokingly, but it, it, but it is reality. That, that church puts up with me. Now, they love her. They tolerate me. Amen. <laughs> So, but uh, we were at the Winter Fire Conference earlier, and then I just told her, I said, why don't you go with me? I think it'd be a, a good trip for you to go. And uh, I especially was excited she could get to Zanesville, and uh, we
we appreciate and I'm thankful that she's with me. And uh, we got, now I know some of you won't like this announcement that I'm about to make, but we got Brother Bounds coming next year, 19, to preach our Western District Camp. And so we're excited about that. Look forward to that. It's a blessing, a blessing to the kingdom of God and the work of God. Amen. Okay, let's uh, let's let's <clears throat> get started here. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, uh, you ought to be glad my wife's with me because she will she'll really fuss at me if I preach too long. If that ever gets out, everybody that ever has become priest will request that she comes with me. So when her fire after church Friday night, I said I preached a little too long, didn't I? She said, mm-hmm, you did. So so I'm, I, I got a little timer up here I'm going to set. I'm not going to tell you what I got it set on, but I got it set. So uh, Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I know it's... Uh, it's a passage of scripture that no doubt you're familiar with or you've heard it preached from or quoted or hopefully you've read it. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He didn't say it was unreasonable. He said it's your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. According to the proportion of faith. Uh, I want to talk to you today. Uh, let, let, me, let, me just, let me just premise with this. The scripture says, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church, what the Spirit is saying. Now, I, I understand, I understand, Arima, I understand a word that God gives to you personally and individually. I understand that. But I also believe that there are th things that the Spirit is speaking expressly to the body. And that's how come all of a sudden uh, you'll, you'll, you'll preach somewhere, you'll say something, they'll say, oh, hey, we, you know, we've been, we've been preaching the same thing, saying the same thing. Well, what that tells me is, is that we're developing an ear to hear what the Spirit's saying. And hopefully today that will be what happens. I, uh, I, I don't even really know what to call this title. And I know you're supposed to have a title. People say they'll forget a message, but they want a title. Well, I hope you remember the message and forget the title. <laughs> Amen. But uh, I want to talk to you today about altars. Altars. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this church. Thank you for Brother and Sister Bounds. I'm thankful for this congregation, the leadership of this church, Evangelist Burns. I pray a special blessing upon all. I pray that you would help me minister effectively your word today, God. We preach in the spirit of truth, which is love. Let me say nothing more, nothing less than I should. Confirm your word with signs following. I thank you for what you're about to do today. I speak it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Turn around, shake somebody's hand, say, do you have an altar in your life? Amen. You may be seated. Now, I know when you say the word altar, it gets quiet. And nobody likes altars. I know, yeah, I love them. No, you don't. Not a real altar. Real altar's bloody. It's a place of death. 
and it's not a pleasant place, especially to that which is dying. Does that make sense to anybody? I um, I can remember a few few years ago. Uh, God normally speaks to me through a dream, and uh, that's why I try to sleep a lot. <laughs> All these guys, three or four hours a night, they're up at four o'clock in the morning. Not Marcus. No, sir. <laughs> I won't give God plenty of time. <laughs> I told Brother Haney one time, Brother Haney used to get up, I think, 4, 4.30. He'd run, jog, and play racquetball. And I told him, I said, that's why God's not talking to you, and he's talking to me. You're too busy out here running and jogging and playing racquetball when you ought to be asleep. <laughs> I won't tell you what he told me after that. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, uh, I, I had this dream, and in the dream, <clears throat> I was in a church, and there was a group of, seemed to me like it was younger men. I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to pick on our young men here. But they were rejoicing like they were dancing gleefully. And I, 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 I asked, well, I said, what, what are y'all doing? And one of them said, we have taken the altar out of the church. We have taken the altar out of the church. Well, <clears throat> needless to say, when you take the altar out of the church, there is absolutely no place for the fire of God to fall. And the fire of God is its a consuming thing. I may talk about that tonight. I'm not sure. It's a consuming thing. And so when we remove altars, there's some things that happen that I'll mention some of it here. Uh, the Apostle Paul. Now, let, let me tell you kind of where I'm at. I get on these journeys, and hopefully it's a good journey. I, I, I jokingly tell some people, what kind of journey are you on if you don't know the destination? Thank God for GPS. I used it coming here this morning. And GPS is real simple. You start at a current location. You can't start somewhere you're not. Now, some people try, <laughs> spiritually speaking now. But the next thing in GPS is, aren't you glad? Seriously, aren't you glad for GPS? I mean, I started evangelizing back in 1934. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was them old road maps, and I'm telling you, you'd have to have a PhD just to fold them things back up. <laughs> it's a wonder more people didn't get killed trying to read that map, drive at the same time you couldn't see, and, and then you try to fold it back, and finally you just get mad at it and throw it out the window. <laughs> but GPS is the next statement is destination. And I believe that all of us ought to have a sense. The general sense of it is, is we're all headed to the same, hopefully, destination. It is a predestination. And that is that we would be conformed into the image of his son. That is the destination. That is predestination. Not talking about individual predestination. That was not Paul's address talking about uh, predestination, the sense of an individual I said this at the conference this week, and I repeat it. I had a guy waiting for me one time after church. and as I cut, Well, actually, I was getting ready to leave, and he, he was standing out there waiting. And I went out, and I, you know, I, I need to tell you something. I said, well, he said, you know, you said something about predestination. He said, I believe in predestination. He said, I believe that some of us are going to be saved, and others aren't going to be saved. And I said, really? I said, well, it's not God's will that any man should perish. And so, I don't, anyway, here we are. And I said, uh, you know, well, then he went on to tell me that he believes something that some, some of us have been around church while we've heard this statement before. This is what it's called. It's called serpent seed doctrine. And the serpent seed doctrine is simply Adam knew Eve and 
birthed Abel. Adam or Eve knew the serpent, had a sexual relationship with the serpent, produced Cain. And so we all fall under one of those seed, either we're of the seed of Adam or we're the serpent seed. Well, the seed of Adam can be saved, but the serpent seed people can't be, <laughs> can't be saved. And so he was explaining that. Of course, it's not the first time I'd heard it, and he, he told me that. And I said, well, <clears throat> I only have one problem with that doctrine. He said, what's that? And I said, the flood. He said, the what? I said, the flood, Noah, the flood. Can you show me where the serpent seed got through the flood? <laughs> there you go. That's the end of that conversation. <clears throat> but thank God for this. But we're, we're on this journey, and, and a lot of times we get into a spiritual flow, a journey, and the Holy Ghost is speaking expressly, and it's leading us and guiding us to some places. And so I, uh, I, I, I've been writing some things out for the district, and uh, I, I have asked the district, it's not a theme, it is what I believe a word from God for us to take, and that focuses around, now just give me a moment here and I'll get to, but around build, build. Uh, we, we've had a lot of things happen in, in California, and uh, as a district, the Western District, we went from, now this is not a, this is not a bad thing as far as why we did it, so I'm not here, but, you know, we kind of went from like 300-something churches, and we multiplied the district, and so now we have the Western District, we have SoCal District, and so, you know, all of a sudden, we, you know, we're not as big of a district as we used to be, and a lot of guys had some pretty strong feelings about that, and so then uh, we had some other things that kind of filtered, <laughs> filtered through lost some churches of that. And so the Lord began to deal with me about, you know, Zerubbabel and the rubble that was there. And he, Zerubbabel said the rubble was so bad, he said, I wouldn't even go look at it at, at, in the daytime. I'd have to sneak out at night, go survey the city. It was horrible rubble. And he said the elders and those princes that had come back, they were very disillusioned by it. But this was the statement to, to Nehemiah was, arise and build. For the Lord will strengthen thy hand. Are you with me here? He will strengthen thy hand. And I, I, I knew, you know, here's these guys sitting here, and they remember Jerusalem and the temple in its glory day, Solomon's temple. But we can either sit around and look at the rubble and just talk about what used to take place and how God used to do this and how glorious it used to be. Okay, maybe there is some rumble, but what are we going to do? Just sit here and look at it and complain about it and live nostalgic? No, we, we need to arise. We need to arise and build. Some of you are looking at rubble in, <clears throat> rubble in your own life. You ever notice that verse of Scripture that says, uh, this is a mountain before you, but that mountain to, to Zerubbabel shall become a plain? You know what that mountain was? It was Jerusalem. When they, when they surveyed it, it looked like a mountain of rubble. And basically what God's telling him is, I'm going to take that rubble right there before you, and I'm going to make it a plain. What's that mean? I'm going to use that rubble to rebuild this city. So you can look at it as rubble, or you can also look at it as some of the resources that God's going to use to build what he really needs to build. And when it comes down to that, a lot of us got rubble in our life. And, oh, my God, I just can't. Yeah, well, why don't you take those things and turn it for the glory of God and to the good of the cause of God and let God take some of that and build you like he really wants to build you. And, oh, by the way, the next verse says, it's not by might nor is it by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. The Holy Ghost wants to help you take rubble in your life and use it to rebuild and to do what he needs to get done. Anybody believe that here today? Now, oh, hang on a second. I think I forgot to start the timer. <laughs> there we go. Three and a half hours, amen. No, 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 it's a joke. 
that's a joke. See, that was pretty slick, wasn't it? I, I got all that little extra time in there right there, you know. Now, the deal is, is so I, I, I've been focusing on this, and so I decided I, I want to write out a little plan. And so I started writing about the word build and, and the concept of build. You, you know, you got kids coming, Isaiah, single baron. If you got kids, you got to build out the tent. You got to make sure you build a, a large enough place in, so you can house these. And so I, I was into all that stuff, you know, build, build, build. And then I, I, I got this inspiration. I really did. I thought, man, this is, this is good. I like this. And it's called Lessons from the Builders. I was like, man, I like that. And so what I found myself doing is I got something over here that's just bigger than a strategy for West Coast. And I'm, I'm like, oh, there, there's a lot of things in this. Because I started going back, and the first lesson from a builder is wisdom. Wisdom has built her house. So I started at wisdom. And then I come down to the plain of Shinar, the Tower of Babel. What can we learn? We learn from wisdom. What lessons can we learn from the Tower of Babel? Well, it's easy. They, they had a location. They had a vision. They had resources. They started making mortar and brick. And then the Bible says that they had oneness. And so these are lessons from builders. These are things that we need. We, we need to happen, so we learn from these, and we also learn how to stop a building project. God taught us that, and the devil's perfected it. Just get them talking a different language. Just bring a little confusion in, a little division in. They can't understand each other. They used to all say the same thing, but now they're all talking something different. Are you with me here? And so I got into that, got into Solomon, got into a bunch of stuff. Jesus, I'll build my church, Solomon built the temple. Paul says, I'm a wise master builder. But this is where I got stuck. I'm still stuck. Was Abraham. Abraham. Because, you know, I'm just, okay, Lord, I, I want to see these people. That, Abraham, what did Abraham build? Altars. And you need to learn and take lessons from him. Woo. And so I, 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 I really started diving into this, and it's, it's a really interesting study. Are you all okay out there? Now, I'm going to tell you, my wife doesn't know this either, but I had a donut a while ago. And a little bit of coffee. And I'm wired up right now. <laughs> Ready to go. Caffeine and sugar is doing its job right now. <laughs> On the way to church, she gave me a fig bar and some unsalted peanuts. <laughs> Here, eat these. They're healthy for you. I don't want healthy. I want sausage, <laughs> eggs, biscuits, and gravy. All right, I'm getting on food, and I'm about to lose everybody here in the building. You know, so now, <laughs> let's get back to the altar. <laughs> so I, I, I got to look at these things, and, and, and there's four places, four geographic locations that there was an altar that he built. There's five times that he went to into the altar, but there's four specific places. And so when he first comes, trust me, I'm not going to go, but when he first comes into the land, he builds an altar, and they call that the altar of promise. He built an altar. He comes into the, here's what's amazing. Now, I'm, I'm on this here, so just, here's what's amazing, and here's our battle. When God speaks to a Abram, when God speaks to Abram in the Ur of Chaldees, he tells him, he says, now, Abram, I want you to go. Now, I understand, and if, you, if, you, if he preaches this, he's right and I'm wrong, okay? <clears throat> the deal is, is he tells Abram to go. Now, I know some people believe that he told his dad. Terra to go, or to however you pronounce it, he tells him, but no, it was specifically to Abram. I want you to go. I want you to leave your family. 
leave your family and go and search for a city that I'm going to build. And so Abram, the father of faith, didn't really obey God like he should have because he takes two family members. He takes his dad and he takes his nephew, which he later calls his brother. He took Terah and he took Lot. He goes to Haran and he settles there. And for five years, he doesn't, he doesn't journey anywhere. He doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't do anything. And it's told of silence for five years. But then the Bible says that his dad died. And he buried his dad in Haran. Now, you have to understand, these, his dad and his family were very wealthy, successful idol makers. These people were wealthy, and they had already lived in a city. And I don't have time to go into the city stuff. But they lived in a city. They were already there. So why in the world, can you imagine what his dad thought when Abram walked in and said, Hey, Dad, I just want you to know God spoke to me and told me that I'm supposed to go find a city. Well, first of all, we already got a city. Why do you need another city? Well, he said, This is the city he's going to build. Really? Uh, show me which one of those idols over there on the shelf said that to you. Uh, he, he's not there. He's what? He, he, he's not there. You, you, no, 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 we have to have an image. We have to have an image. We've got to have an idol over here to represent some God. I'm telling you, Dad, he's invisible, but he speaks. Now, you've got something visible that can't speak. He's invisible and can speak. And his dad said, you lost your mind. I better go with you and make sure you're okay. So finally, after five years, his dad dies, and the moment he gets this sounds horrible. He just gets done bearing his death on dirt on him. And the next thing you know, God speaks to Abraham. So what you doing here? This is not where I told you. Now that your father has died and the flesh, the flesh has been buried. Now why don't you continue your journey? So he goes from Haram and he ends up at a place called, later it becomes Bethel. And he builds an altar there, and the Bible says, I feel like preaching right now. And the Bible says that the Canaanite was then in the land. And he builds an altar to God. And it's there that God begins to make him a promise. My Lord. That's the first altar he built was an altar of promise. Now, he goes just a little ways further, and he gets between Ai and Bethel and Jericho and all through there, and he builds another altar. And it's at that altar, the Bible says, now remember, the first one is an altar of promise. But the second altar that he builds, the Scripture says it was there that Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Yes, Woo! Yes, the only way to translate that is that's where Abraham really began to worship because in the Old Testament, to call on the name of the Lord meant worship and obedience. It goes all the way back to Enoch. For then, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, Woo. And when Paul picks it up in the New Testament and he said, and whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wasn't talking about come on down to some altar and have a mental ascent and just verbally confess, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There, I've called upon the name of the Lord. And that's not what Paul was talking about. He was reaching all the way back to Abram and Enoch's altars, and he said, this is what calling on the name of the Lord means. It means obey, and it means to worship. It's a place of intimacy with God. Woo, praise God. Now, some of you like your altar promise where God tells you, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But you got to travel from that altar to the next altar, and that altar is an altar of worship. People that don't worship God have no revelation of God. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Isn't it amazing? I'm, I'm stuck right here. I'm telling you, I'm stuck right here. Isn't it amazing that, that the writer of Hebrews says, and eh, you know, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you ready for this? He that cometh to in the, in the Greek means he that worships. So it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that worships God must believe that he is. 
You can't worship something you don't have faith or believe in. Must believe that he is God, and as God, he is a rewarder. The word reward means revelation. I reveal myself to a worshiper. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that you ready for it? Diligently seek. Look it up. You got your phone right there. Well, I hope you don't do it while I'm preaching, but hit Strong's Concordance and go and find out. I'm telling you the truth because they that seek him is worship and diligently and all that. That also means worship. So you could translate that verse with this. For without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that worships God must believe that he is God and as God he brings revelation to those that worships him. Jesus didn't say for the Father seeketh such to watch him. We got a lot of apostolics. They come to church and they just watch. They watch and they leave. They leave in. I don't know what everybody got excited about. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't. I don't know what everybody was jumping around about. So I, I, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I know I'm stuck. And the timer's going off here in a little bit. For he, that's that's man seeking God. That's where man was at. He falls in the garden and he's plummeted into darkness. He has no Bible. He doesn't have, he doesn't have five-fold ministry. He doesn't have history. He doesn't have the church. And now man's got to find God. And God says, I'm going to show you how to do it. So when he slew that animal at the altar, basically, and he clothed Adam, he was teaching humanity, this is how you find me, is you build an altar and you worship me. And that's why God had regard to one boy's offering and he did the other one because the other one was following the type that God had given them and the other said, no, I'll take it from the dirt. God said, no. Did I lose y'all? No. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is at the well Quickly, Jesus is at the well, and this conversation starts. And this, you know, he said, Lady, the hour's coming when you're not going to worship at Mount Gehazi, and it's not even going to be in Jerusalem. There's going to be true worshipers. Oh, yeah, yeah, and you know, the conversation that gets into. And finally, he said, Look, lady, you're, 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 you're just not getting it. You're, you're, you're just not getting it. So I'm going to have to break it down where you do. It's not that the hour's in the future, but the hour now is. When the true worshiper shall worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Hebrews 11, you got man seeking God, but in John 4, you got God seeking man. And the common denominator between both of those is a word called worship. Uh, did you hear me? Uh, we may not get any further than this altar right here today. It's a word called worship. 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 God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice that's not capital S and that's not capital T. I was raised an apostolic. Are you listening? And all my life I've heard, well, bless God, when you worship, you worship in the spirit. You got to worship in truth. That's not what that verse meant. He's not talking about the spirit of God, and he's not talking about the truth of doctrine or Jesus' truth. But what he is saying is it's a small s and a small t. He's talking about your spirit, and he's talking about your truth. Well, what's that mean? That means the deepest part of you emotionally and spiritually begins to worship, and truth is honesty and sincerity without hypocrisy. So God says, I'll tell you the qualifications for a true worshiper. It's got to come from the deepest part of you, and you've got to be honest and sincere before me. Woo! And so when it says that they worship and they obey, it's the fulfillment of Jesus. For the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. My God, have mercy. Spirit deals with the worship. Spirit deals with the intimacy. And truth deals with obedience. And that's where men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, let me help you out here. You ready for it? You ever been in a church service and just kind of all of a sudden, I didn't, I'm not talking about praise. I'm talking about worship. And all of a sudden, you begin to worship God. And God says, come here. I'm sure oh, yeah, I shouldn't, but here we go. I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. You got 10 lepers that come. And Jesus says, go show thyself to the priest. Thou art cleansed. I'm fixing to help some of you about faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Somebody's going to build an altar of worship here today. And when you do, look out. Because God's about to show you something. We get so, you know, y'all better sit down here just a second. 
You know, we get so caught up in faith. I watch people, they come to the altar, and we talk about faith. Faith is such things hope for. And it's like this mental deal. Got to have faith. Oh, my God. I've got to have faith. Got to have faith. Got to have faith. And we almost get into anxiety about faith. I've got to get my mind just right. And I can't allow any, any doubt in my brain. You ever watch people come pray for a miracle? Begging. Pleading. Got to get faith. Got to have faith. Got to have faith. You understand? Got to have faith. Ten lepers, go show thyself to the priest. Thou art cleansed. They had to go get an offering, go down to the priest, offer the offering to the priest, and he'd offer it to God. Then he'd come out, and he'd examine them to make sure there was no active leprosy. Right? But anybody know what leprosy does? It consumes. It eats the flesh. So they're cleansed. There's no more leprosy. But oh, Joe, he's still got half his face. Seriously, that's leprosy. Missing and others got jaw gone and fingers gone. That's leprosy. Leprosy is a flesh consuming. That's the reason why in the scripture, leprosy is considered sin. Sin consumes the flesh. And so what happens is, is they go down there, so they all go, hey, bless God, leprosy's gone. Leprosy's gone. But Brother Bounce, one returned to Jesus, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, go thy way, thy. When Jesus viewed worship, he called it faith. How can you worship something you don't believe in? I've seen more miracles happen in a worship service because people just got their mind off. I gotta have faith. I gotta get this mental ascent. I gotta, I gotta get the scriptures, you know. Bless God, I've been told I gotta quote these verses. And we almost get pain trying to by this miracle. Oh, boy, I've lost a bunch of you. I know it makes you look all spiritual when you walk around quoting the Bible all the time. I got faith. I got faith. Well, there's something higher than faith. Charity's higher than faith. Ooh, I'm losing a bunch of you right now. You, I know people walk around all the time quoting the scripture, got faith, got faith. They ain't worshiped God in 29 years. If you really believe that he's God and you really believe what you're quoting, don't you think you ought to worship him? Don't you think you ought to build an altar of worship? And Jesus looked at that man and said, go thy way. Watch him, watch him. Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee. Oh, you got nine cleansed of leprosy, but they're not whole. So we got all these people start coming to church. I'm meddling now. Got all these people start coming to church, and man, you preach to them the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection, and they hit the water. They baptize in Jesus' name. They repented. They died out to this whole world. God fills them with the Holy Ghost. Leprosy's gone. Judgment begins in the house of God. Thank God for the power of the name and the blood and all that stuff. And then that's as far as they go. That they're still sitting out there and sin took stuff from them and they're still not complete and they're still not whole. They don't even know how to look like Jesus hardly. They don't even know what the whole man looks like. Woo. But when you begin to worship God, he said, I'm about to make you whole. Because when you begin to worship God, he reveals himself to you. Can I pick on you just a second, buddy? Yeah, stand up here. And all of a sudden, you stand for Jesus, and Jesus said, there you go. See, I got And now you're sitting there, and you, your leprosy's taking one of your fingers. I'm just using this as a, I'm, you're going to be God, and I'm going to be. I knew God was a black man all the time. You know that? Amen. <laughs> and so you're going to get a revelation here today. 
Here's the deal. So, you know, Jesus is standing there. He's got five fingers on his hand, and you're sitting there, and, and you go to worshiping God, and all of a sudden, you see yourself. You see the wholeness of Jesus Christ because he's revealing himself to you in worship. And then you look at yourself, and you say, oh, wait a minute. I, that, oh, so I, 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 that's wholeness? So you never understand that until you get into a place of worship and Jesus can reveal himself to you and he can show you what he truly is as the whole man. And so all of a sudden, in that atmosphere of worship, you realize, you know what? I, I, I need something restored that sin took from me. I, I, I need something restored back to me. That, and it's in that atmosphere that he not only shows you the total of Jesus Christ, but he also begins to show you, I can make you whole right here. Now you show, thank you. You show me a worshiper, I'll show you somebody on their way to being whole. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Not to watch him, to worship him. You show me somebody that comes to the house of God and says, I'm going to worship him in spirit and in truth. I'll show you somebody. It can be deader than a hammer in that service to everybody else. And they're worshiping God. And you know what they leave saying? They don't leave saying, man, oh, he missed it tonight. My God, man, I wish, where'd you get that evangelist, Brother Morgan? I wish you'd have. They leave saying, oh, my God, I felt like the prophet in the glory of the Lord and his train filled the house of God. I seen something in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. So you got to build an altar to your flesh and you got to drag your flesh down to the altar and say, Uzziah, you got to die. You're going to have to die. If I'm going to see God high and lifted up, you've got to die. You ever studied Jehoshaphat and the whole story about him? And they went out before the Lord and praised him in the beautiful holiness and all. You ever read that story? Do you understand who they were fighting against? Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites. You know who they were? They're the descendants of Lot and Esau. All through the scripture, those three represents flesh. Carnality and flesh. Your battle is not the devil. Quit blaming the devil for your stupidity. The devil's not your problem. Your flesh is your problem. And as long as your flesh is in control, you got a problem. It was the flesh that was marching against Judah. Not the 12 tribes, but against Judah, against praise. It's your flesh that fights you to praise God. It's your flesh that resists to worship God. That's why before you ever get to the place of praise or worship, you've got to drag that carcass of yours down to the altar. Now, we used to do that in old time Pentecost. We're going to have a prayer meeting before church. Why? We're going to build an altar. You shouldn't start building altars during the church service. You ought to have built an altar seven days a week before you ever got here. You should have an altar in your life. You ought to learn how to die daily. We spend more time in a Pentecostal church service just trying to get people past their flesh. Boy, I'm about to mess this service up. Just past the flesh. We got to sing 39 songs just to get you past your flesh. Get up here and become prime ministers. You'll figure that one out by the time you get home. You know what they call it a pulpit? We're always trying to pull people out of the pit. We almost feel like Pentecostal cheerleaders for Jesus. Give me a J. Give me an E. Give me an S U S. What's that spell? Jesus. Woo! You know why? Because you fussed all the way to church. Homes are nothing but confusion. No altar in the home. No fire in the home. Fuss all the way to church. Then come sliding in, put on your hypocrite smile. Boys, you say, send that guy back to California. Look, we got the same problem in California as you do here right now. Flesh, just flesh, just flesh. I rebuke the devil. Yeah, well, I show you the devil. Got a mirror. <laughs> Why in the world do you think God cursed him and put him on his belly? There's not a snake. I Googled it, so it's got to be true. <laughs> There's not a snake anywhere that eats dirt. You know what that means, Brother Bounce? It means you will consume humanity through their dirt or 
through their flesh. That's what you will work through. And Paul called it the works of the flesh. That's the battles of that flesh. You're, you don't want to worship God. It's not natural in you to want to worship God. I was born wanting to worship God. No, you weren't. You was born in a damnic nature. It totally resisted God. I come out of my mama's womb talking in tongues. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Well, I've talked in tongues until I got an accent. No, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. That flesh of yours is your biggest battle. Your flesh is enmity against God. Your carnal, sit down, sit down. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start wrapping up. That donut's going to start wearing off here in just a little bit. <laughs> that flesh of yours is enmity against God. Your carnal mind, carnal, you know where the root, carnivorous. The carnal mind is a flesh eating. Your, 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 your mind becomes, now I'm headed there, your mind becomes consuming of the flesh it has a fleshly appetite that's what the carnal mind means you've gone from the appetite of the bread the word and now you have an appetite for fleshly things three minds in the scripture unregenerated regenerated and carnal unregenerated mind somebody's not filled with the spirit their mind's never been renewed regenerated mind somebody's been born again Carnal mind, somebody's been born again, but it's going back toward the flesh. And Paul said the carnal mind is not subject to any law. The devil doesn't make me fearful at all, but I tell you what strikes fear in my heart. You ready for it, Brother Bounds? Carnal saint. they're not subject to any law. Whew. Boy, it's quiet in Zanesville right now. Now to the text. I beseech you therefore, and brother, and I'll get back to the altar some of the time. I'll come back out. Nine years later, in another nine years, Brother Bounds, I'll come. I'll come. And I know you've tried. I, I'm this. I'll come back nine years later, and we'll talk some more about altars. I beseech you therefore, and brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living. That means continual, perpetual. You don't die one time and it's over. You die daily. 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 Is this just old stuff? I mean, am I, am I boring you guys? Daily. Every day. You got to have that altar. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. Your, your body, a living sacrifice? Yeah. Yeah. Holy. See, you cannot manifest holiness until that flesh of yours dies. Ooh. Holiness is the true nature and essence of God. And as long as your flesh is active and in control, People cannot see holiness. I don't care how long your hair is. I don't care how long your sleeve is. Pentecost, long sleeves, long hair, and long tongues. <laughs> and I'm for all, I'm not the long tongues. I believe in all the other. Don't misunderstand me. But see, we get trapped. Well, as long as I'm doing that, I'm okay. Yeah, I know some people, they look godly. I mean, they look the part, but they meaner than junkyard dogs. And I know about junkyard dogs. The last thing the man told my dad in a junkyard in southeast Missouri with a German shepherd over there is, oh, as long as you're close to me, he don't bite. And I was right on that guy's heels, and the next thing I know, that German shepherd bit me, got me by the back of my foot. I mean, tore the whole hill out of my shoe. I thought I'd die and go into heaven. <laughs> God, I can't believe he did that. I'm telling you, 
you can look the part but not have true holiness because you can learn the trappings of things, but that old flesh of yours still be pretty active and still be pretty alive. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, here's where I'm going to start tapering off. Be not conformed to this world. That means, are you ready for it? That means to join in union with, to become like, especially externally. You don't really have to do much of anything to be conformed. Just live. Just live life. You conform to it. It's a natural instinct in man. It's a natural thing in man. He just conforms to what's external out there. He just conforms to that stuff. You know, people tickle me. You know, they say, well, all you apostolic holiness people, y'all all look the same to me. Well, you know what? I can say the same thing about the world. I mean, somebody decides this is the fad and the fashion we're going. <laughs> somebody don't know whether he's a he or a she. There we go. And design something, says this is the way we're going to be in society. Just here they go, conforming to it. And then we got people, I ain't going to let no preacher tell me how to look and what to look like and how to dress. Nobody's going to tell me, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody's going to tell you. I'm, I'm my free. I'm, no, 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 no. That, that's not how this works. Just watch people. They just follow right along. Just follow right along. I'm losing some of you right now. Yeah, that's just the way it goes. And so we get into all this whole thing. Now, I upset somebody right there, but you, you, we're going to talk. We're going to bring you to the altar here in a little bit. I found out something about dead people. You ready for it? You can talk about them, slap them, punch them, take their money. They never raise up out of the coffin saying, don't do that. When you're really dead to the flesh, you're not easily offended. When that old flesh of yours is working. You can get offended real easy. I don't like what he said. I don't like what she did. I don't. Okay, I got to quit. I, I, I'm starting to see it. We're going to have to hurry and close and beat the Baptist to the restaurant here in a little bit. Amen. <laughs> you still with me here? Be not conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And there's the key. There's the key. See, your mind cannot be renewed until you visit the altar and something dies out. Because until that happens, you're still in control. You're still operating out of that. Does this make sense to anybody? You can, well, for some reason, I, 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 I kind of know where we're, who, who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ. Man, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my Father which is in heaven. And five verses later, do you know what Jesus said to him? Five verses later, get thee behind me, Satan. You're talking about falling from the pinnacle of revelation to being called Satan. Now, you got offended when I said devil. Let me use the word Satan. Satan just means adversary. One moment he's blessed because it's coming by revelation. And the next minute it's just coming out of his own thinking. Jesus said, I'm going to go die in Jerusalem. And Peter said, no, you're not going to die. Bless God. And he, he meant it. I mean, later on, he, he, he's the only one. He, he pulls the sword and trying to use it. He wasn't just trying to nick that guy and just get his attention. He's trying to cut his head off. And Jesus said, put your sword up. See, all of a sudden, he quits thinking out of a spiritual thought, and he starts having, you ready for it? A carnal moment, fleshly moment. His perception, his idea, his thinking, his will. She said, no, 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 get thee behind me, Satan. And what can happen is, is people that don't have an altar in their life and they don't die out, what can happen is, is the man of God can walk in that pulpit and he can start telling you what God's been speaking, prophetically, this stuff and all. And you want your brain to start telling you, uh, that's not going to happen. How can that happen? Oh, and the next thing you know, you're on your way home. Now, just listen, I'm not after anybody. You're on your way home and you start talking. 
That's crazy. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't see how that can happen. I just don't see what we can do. It, it just, you know, I don't see how we can reach it. And, 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 and next thing you know, are you ready for him? You've literally become, I know you're going to leave there saying, my God, Brother Bounds, you brought him in here and he called us a devil and Satan in one service. <laughs> but you've become Satan, which means adversary. The carnal mind is enmity. It's an adversary against the mind of God. And so the next thing you know is the Holy Ghost can be speaking, the Holy Ghost can be trying to direct, and you're thinking. That's why you've got to drag yourself down to the altar, and you've got to crucify that, and you've got to allow your mind to be renewed. Because you cannot do the will of God until first your mind becomes renewed. And that's where people struggle is in that dying out to their thinking, to their ways, to their will. And allowing the will of God to be perfected and formed through them. Now, if you'll give me five minutes, I'll be through. Is that fair enough? Now, here's the deal. He didn't stop there. He said, hey, he said, man, by the grace given to me, in other words, this is my ministry. This is what God gave me. And I'm telling you this by, by this. He said, a man should not think of himself. A man should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. For God has dealt to every man. Measure of faith. You know what that, can I pick on you a little bit? What's your name? Giovanni. What is it? Giovanni. Giovanni? You come to church here, Giovanni? Yes. Okay, come up here. It's okay. I'm not going to tell God to kill you or anything, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, Giovanni, here's Giovanni. You know, you know what you just said? You should not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. For God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, I've, listen, I've heard this preached a million different ways. Now, if he preached something different, he's right and I'm wrong. Okay? Seriously. But the deal is, when he says the measure of faith, where does faith come from? You know that? Do you know where faith comes from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. There you go. So when God speaks to you his will, he sets the boundaries. There's your box. There's the boundaries. Don't go any further past that. Because if you go past what I spoke to you and you go past what I put into your mind, you're putting yourself out of pride in my seat. You now assume the position of God because your will's taken back over. Okay, Giovanni, you stand right here. I need one more guy. Pick me out. Pick me out another guy. You? Okay, come on. I like you. He's right here. Okay. Now, now, Giovanni, there you are. Now I'm on this time I'm gonna be God. Now we got a white God. Amen. I'm a, it always goes back to that, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Probably Jesus a little in between us right there. <laughs> now Amen. Giovanni, I want you to go through. I'm God, okay? Now I'm going to set the perimeters. This is my will for your life. You ready? I want you to go three steps and stop. All right. Very good. What's your name? Toady. Toady? I want you to go seven steps and stop. There you go. See, as God, I'm the one that set these perimeters. This is my will. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to let North American culture dictate to you what success is. See, in America, culture, everything's about moving forward. God spoke something to me years ago that I've never forgotten. You ready for it? He said, ministry and you being used of me is like a chess piece on a chess board. And not every move is forward. I can move you sideways. I can even move you backwards. And then he really got my attention. And if I need to, I could sacrifice you for a bigger move. And that's the one I had trouble with. I don't, oh God, I don't. He said, okay, resurrect John the Baptist and ask him. Uh, I'm losing this one. <laughs> Are you here? Do we look for another? Well, my God, you proclaimed he's the Lamb of God from the banks of Jordan. I know, but it's not going the way I thought it was supposed to go. 
And that's where we all get in trouble because the will of God sometimes is not going. Now, I'm, I'm on something here right now. It's not going the way you thought it was, should go. And so now you start entering the position of God and you start telling God, you, you start becoming a creator of God. Instead of you being the creature and him being the creator, you want to change all this around. And so out of your own thing, I'm talking to Holy Ghost filled people here today. Out of your own thinking, you know, you just know where God's going to do. And you just know because after all, I mean, I know. Now, Giovanni, here's where you're going to get in trouble. Hypothetically, here's where you're going to get in trouble. So you say, well, wait a minute. He got to go seven steps. Are you married? Okay, good. Are you looking? You keep looking over here somewhere. Is there something over here I need to, something over here I need to, where's she at? Uh, yeah, I see you up there hid among the stuff. Now, Javon, okay, now you're married. <laughs> I'm going to give you some good advice. Seriously. You ready for it? You ready for it? Here's what happens a lot of times. Well, I don't understand. I don't know why he got to go seven steps, and I only got to go three. Okay? Now, here's, here's, here's life, Brother Bounds. Here's life. A lot of times you've even got a wife over here or somebody loves you dearly that starts saying, well, that's not fair. Because every woman, every wife wants their husband to be successful. You want his ministry to be like somebody else's ministry. Ooh. You want his life to be like somebody else's life. And so you start measuring Giovanni with Tody. Well, that's not fair. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. That's not fair. And so she starts putting, nah, she'd never do that. She's a good person up there. I don't even know if y'all are going to get married. You want me to prophesy it right now? I could prophesy it if you, it costs a hundred bucks. I can prophesy it right now. Five hundred, I won't prophesy it. We're going to go to the highest bidder here right now. And so, Hypothetically, they're, they're married now, and she's just like, I don't understand this. I just, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I've had to deal with this over and over and over and over. And so now all of a sudden, because of your own thinking, now you think you know the next steps. And you go beyond the boundaries. And you step into your mind, your will, and what you think, and you compare yourselves among yourselves, which makes you not wise, and you just took four steps God didn't tell you to take. And God says, so you want to be God? Protect yourself. All right, so then I'm going to tell one story, and I'm through. Did that timer go off? <laughs> Probably a long time, Sister Morgan. I know that look. That looks, I'm not saying nothing, but you know what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> I was preaching in a church one time, this was years ago, and uh, the music director of that church was molesting boys in the building. And pastor knew it's a problem and he's trying to, and it's just, you know, a lot of stuff nowadays, especially legal stuff. And so I'm preaching and all of a sudden the Lord showed it to me. And I, if he never shows me that kind of stuff again, I'm happy. Seriously. And so I, I just said, everybody lift your hands and worship God. I, I told the church, I said, there's a man in this church. God just showed me who you are. And I said, you have molested boys in this building. I said, he even showed me the Sunday school class. And so I said, let's worship God. I mean, boy, they went to pray and worship God. And I slipped down off the platform and went down to the man. He's <laughs> opened his eyes. His wife's standing right next to him. He said, yes, sir. I said, you're the man. You. And it's like he all of a sudden got the flu. Like he's going to throw up. 
He goes, run out of the building. Run out of the building. And so his wife followed him out. She come back in a little bit later. And she said, now the church didn't even know I'd gone to him. And so she come in a little bit later. She said, I just want you to know my husband. It's not what you said. He doesn't understand that. It's just that he got very sick and all. And I said, sister, I hate to tell you this, but your husband knows. And I said, he's got a major problem and he needs help. So I went to the pastor and I told him. I said, look, he's, and he's weeping. He said, oh, my God, Brother Morgan. My God, that's him. And so I told the pastor, I said, if that man doesn't come clean, I'll come back in 30 days and I'll stand in that pulpit and I'll call him out. Because I'm going to tell you something. That is heinous. I said, all right. I was about two weeks into the 30 days and I have a dream. And in the dream, there's a man standing there and a real muscular kind of looking guy. And then there's a, a, a smaller guy over here. And, but I knew that it was a, a physical altar. And, and I, told the, I told the smaller guy, I said, you can take him. I know he looks bigger and stronger, but you can take him. Hit him. And he goes, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. And I said, well, if you don't, I will. And I hit that guy. It was either two or three times as hard as I could hit him. It never even phased him. And then he drew back to hit me. And when he did, I knew in the dream, when he hits me, he'll kill me. He'll kill me. And so when, when he punched and he hit, the scene changed in the dream. And I'm in an auditorium. And I'm looking on the platform stage. And there's about a half dozen people or so up there. And there's a body laying up there, Brother Bounds. And there's a sheet over that body. And I walked up there and I said to them, I said, who, who is this? No, no, no. You, you don't need to be here. You need to go away. Just, just leave. Go away. I said, no, I want to know. So in the dream, I reached down, and I pulled the sheet back, and there was my wife. And it's a weird dream, but she's laying there, and she had a funnel stuck right here. And I got down there, and I said, oh, my God. And I looked up to one of the men, and I said, how did this happen? And this is what he said. You ready for it? You got in a battle God didn't call you to. And you open a door for the enemy to come against your family. And the enemy destroyed your wife through her mind. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning and I woke up. She never even knew I'd left. Got in the car and I drove down to the church. And I got in the altar, the altar, the altar, the altar, the altar, the altar, the altar. Where your will dies and God says, this is my will. I beg God, please show me what is the battle I got into that I shouldn't have. This is when God showed me what I'm about to tell you. He said, I didn't tell you to go back in 30 days. You said that. I never told you to do that. I told you this, and that's all you should have said. If you go back, you go back against my will, and you will leave your family totally unprotected. Safest place I know to live is at the altar. I called the pastor of the church and said, I'm sorry, I can't come back. It really upset him. He's a friend of mine. He said, you got to come back. I said, I can't. I will not come back. What am I going to do? I said, I don't know. What's God said? I don't know. He didn't, he didn't tell me anything beyond that. This is the measure of faith. This is all that I can prophesy. Later in the sixth verse, he said, if you're going to prophesy, prophesy according to proportion of faith. That simply means you can only say what God told you to say. You can only do what God told you to do. But you'll never know that until you get to the altar and you die out to what you think and to what you want and where you think your life ought to go and you think this is the will of God, how do you know it's the will of God if it was not determined at the altar? Jesus Christ did not die at Calvary on the cross. 
Jesus Christ died the night before in the garden when he was handed a cup it was not a cup of sin it was a cup of suffering Moses and Elijah already told him what would happen the prophets already told him what would happen your visage will be marred they're going to beat your face off they'll beat you beyond recognition it's going to be a horrible death like a lamb going to the slaughter and in, in that garden, God handed Jesus Christ that cup of suffering and said, drink it. And Jesus looked, not sin, but suffering. He looked at it and said, I can't. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want it. I don't want to have to drink that cup. But there at the altar... There in prayer, nobody else with him. He couldn't take, couldn't take Terry, couldn't take Lot. He couldn't even take 12 disciples. They couldn't even stay awake. But he's by himself, and he's struggling with it. And God said, I'll tell you what else is at the altar. My fire's at the altar. So are angels at the altar. And you'll struggle on, and that flesh of yours will die out. I'll send angels down to strengthen you, to get you on to the will of God. Whoo, you got to shot to my guy. And finally, Jesus in agony says, but nonetheless, but nonetheless, but nonetheless, are you listening to me? But nonetheless, but nonetheless, nothing lesser than that will I do. Nonetheless, not my will, nothing less than your will. I'm not going to subvert my will over your will. I know I'm going to suffer if I have to do this. I know I'm going down a path that I necessarily don't want to go down but if this is your will I accept it nonetheless not my will but thy will be done that's where Jesus Christ died and God is about to start talking to this church about some things that some of you are going to say oh I don't understand that and God is going to call this church to the altar are you listening to me in the Holy Ghost he's going to call you to the altar because you've reached a place listen to me you've reached a place nine years ago well, I, you know brother Bounce sometimes I, it's hard for me to remember some things I do say and probably God that's a gift from God <laughs> but this is what I felt in the Holy Ghost I spoke to that church and they have done my will but I'm getting ready now to take them a few more steps. You are not to compare yourself to any other apostolic church. You're not to look at any other UPC church and look at them and what they're doing and pattern this church after that. You understand that? God is going to speak to this congregation. He's going to speak to the pastor of this church. He's going to speak to the team of this church. You listen, he's going to speak to this church. And if you're operating in the flesh, it won't make a lick of sense to you. And if you're not careful, you'll speak against it because you don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. Hila Boshai. It doesn't, listen to me, okay, listen. It doesn't make any sense to me. Zanesville, Ohio? You got to be kidding me. Now, I passed an old Moe Gill home. I get it. But I'm just telling you, my God, Zanesville, that kind of a church? Where am I at in the southeast corner of Ohio? We're just a few miles away from West Virginia. <laughs> Thank God. I know, I know. There was that Satan speaking out of me right there. God has some more steps for global impact for this church. And the only way it will be revealed is God's going to call this church to the altar. And at the altar, you're going to die out to what you think and how you think it ought to be done. And you're going to get out of God's seat and let God speak to you and let God declare to you collectively and individually it's going to happen. Some of you have been standing there in your three steps and you got real comfortable with it. And now you don't even need the Holy Ghost to tell you what to do. You've learned how to operate it through the works of the flesh. You know the next step. But the Holy Ghost is saying, I'm fixing to take you in a territory you've never been before. But the only way I can get you there is you're going to have 
to die out and decide, not my will, but thy will be done. So when God starts, oh, here we are. And if you don't get it that way, let me tell you what God's alternative is. He'll start messing with your stuff. He'll look at you. Come here, Jimmy. He'll look at you right there, and you'll say, well, I'm pretty comfortable here. I like it right here. This is a pretty good place. I've learned what to do here. I have a lot of security here. This, I'm successful in this part of my ministry in my life. And God says, well, I want you to go a few more steps. Jeve said, I don't want to go a few more steps. I'm pretty happy where I'm at right now. I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at right now. And I know I've preached way too long this morning. I, 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 I'm just really happy where I'm at. And God said, now, Jeve, we're going to do this the easy way or we're going to do it the hard way. I can whisper it to you and speak to you and you ought to hear it at the altar. If you're dead, you'll hear my voice. But if not, you leave me no other alternative. I'll start messing with your stuff. I'll mess with your finances. I'll mess with your family. I'll mess with you physically. Have I killed this service here today? I'll mess with you until I get you so frustrated with where you're at. You'll beg me to know what to do next. Ooh, I don't want to have to go that way. I had open heart surgery in August. Went in one, thinking one thing, come out another. I begged God to heal me. Begged him to heal me. Pleaded with him to heal me. I don't get this, God. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen blinded eyes, deaf ears. People come out of wheelchairs. By the thou of oh God, I've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. Please, please heal me. And one of the verses that God gave me was, in Jesus the Son, learn obedience to the things that he suffered. Meaning, you don't even know obedience till I ask you to go down a path you don't want to go. As long as that path is something that you like and you enjoy, you'll never learn true obedience there. Mm. Whoo. So I went in. I was going to do a little valve repair and went through my side and got in there and there's a bunch of complications and, and I had to open up and I got valves put in, mechanical valves and all this stuff and all. And I come out of the hospital and, and uh, it, it, I just still struggling. God, oh God, I don't see anything in this. What in the world? What in the world? My surgeon come out the day I was 11 days in the ICU, 11 days. He come out. He said, uh, Reverend, I need you to do me a favor. I said, all right. He said, I need you to go do whatever you're supposed to do and impact what you're supposed to impact because you're a miracle. I said, all right. I really thought, Brother Bounds, that when I got home, just laying there, it would just be one thing after another coming from God. He maketh me lie down. No, only two things God spoke to me. Only two things. Number one, I was with you in that surgery room, and your surgeon knows it man called me a little later, told me, he said, when you were in surgery, I was praying. And he said, God, show me in a vision. I seen you come. I heard the surgeon say, I seen the operating room. And I heard the surgeon say, my God, we're losing him. And I found out later, apparently I was bleeding out. Oh, my God, we've lost him. We're losing him. <laughs> First thing. Second thing. A dream. Church parking lot on my knees and I start bending backwards oh. and it just kept going back and back further and further and further come here just sit right there further and further and further further and further, further. until I was totally arched backwards and the Holy Ghost spoke to me in that dream and said I will bend you like a bow for my use. (laughs) 
I said, God, what? What? Just in a few days, he gave me a piece of it. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, and I'm, this is for you too. He said, every bow needs arrows. And he said, the first thing I want you to see is when the old prophet, when he put his hand on the hand of the king, he said, shoot through that window. He said, if this goes where it's supposed to go, it has to be guided by the prophetic. And that's it. And then he showed me something else. He said, when he took those arrows and he smoked the ground, he didn't take them and hit the ground like this. He took those arrows and he drove them into the ground. And he reached for another one. He was taking arrows and smiting the earth with it. Stuck another one in. And then another one. And then the verse come. And happy is the man that has a quiver full. I said, who are these arrows? He said, they are sons and daughters in the gospel. And your ministry now is to put them to their destiny. You are to aim them by the prophetic. You are the bow. <laughs> Fire them and smite the earth. You will take this entire Bay Area. By these arrows as you smite them into cities and as you smite them into the earth, I'll give you total victory. I have my part to play. I got my part in geographical to play. But this man and those arrows and this church has a part to play. I don't understand why God chooses the places that he chooses, but he did. Are you listening to me here today? He did. Now this church is moving to another dimension. It's not about all about him now. It's about God moving him into a position that he is to become the bow, the instrument that God used to project people to their destinies and to their ministries and to the right cities and to the right nations and to the right communities. You've just begun. You haven't even seen anything yet. You've only taken three steps right now. But God is about to tell this church, here's the next step, here's the next step, here's the next step, and here's the next. Are y'all listening to me here today? And here's the next step. I Yalahasha. Woo! I'm, I'm done. Train them to be apostolic. Equip them to be apostolic. And then release them into the earth. Yes, sir. Smite the ground. Smite every community around here that needs a church. Yes, Get beyond the state. Get into other states. Get into other nations. God will raise up missionaries out of this church. He'll raise up apostolic leaders out of this church. The world will say, what is this that has come out of Zanesville, Ohio? What is this? Arrows. That's what they are. Arrows. Every one of you are arrows. Not my will, not my will. We, listen, we cannot fire them to where we want them to go. The old prophet come by. Eastward. Eastward. Fire the arrow eastward. Shakota la mashai. Le kota shato makai. Le rorobo shai. Ikata. We will not be guided by our own understanding. Not even be guided by where there is a need. It will be guided by the prophetic. It will come at the altar in prayer when the Holy Ghost says this and this and this. Not just to this church generally. I'm talking to some of you right now. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I don't know what the next phase of my life is. I don't know where my ministry is taking me. I'm going to tell you, you're never going to find it by reading it in the book. You're not even going to get on YouTube and find it. You're not going to find it on Facebook. You're not going to find it anywhere else. I'm going to tell you where you're going to find it. You're going to find it when you grab your will and your ways and you drag yourself down to the altar and you put the sword of the word to your life and you say you got to die out I can't afford to let 
a carnal mind dictate to me where I'm supposed to be going right now. I feel the Holy Ghost very strong in this service right now. I believe today God will give some of you a sure word of prophecy if you'll just clear your mind right now and if you'll just get out of your thinking and out of what you believe for the church, for you, for him, whatever. Just get it out of your brain. This is what I think. I think that Jesus ought to ascend to the throne of his father David. I think he ought to raise up an army. I think we all ought to get a sword. That's what Peter thought. And Jesus said, put your sword up. That's not how I'm going to do it. It will not come through a sword. It will come through an arrow. Stand to your feet all over this room. He, the awkwardness you felt, is the breaking of your way and the way you do things and how you pray to do the will of God. And please listen to me. He has no clue. At the last Sunday service I preached, I preached about the prophet. And I preached, and I came up here with bows. And I came with arrows in my hand. Brother Morgan, not, not to say your direction was wrong, but that's, that's south and that's east. <laughs> Hear me. But I stood with Josh Castle with a bow in his hand and I put my hand on his and I aimed that direction. And I shot through the east window. And you turned as a sign to this church. As a sign to me. That the best is yet to come. God has called you here. He has led you here. You are not here by accident. But I promise you in the Holy Ghost, I'm going to train you to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Arrows in the hand of, of the hand of God. I mean, want to be used of the Lord Almighty. Where's Josh Castle? Where's Josh Castle? Run. Run up here. Run up here. Amen. He's a backslider that the Lord brought back to the church. And there's many more that God's going to bring back to the church. That's the third prophecy that I have seen about arrows. You're the third prophecy about the arrows. Hallelujah, honey. You know this is an act of God. But the awkwardness of you have felt is your continual disobedience to the altar that God has called you to. The last message preached in the church by this evangelist was the altar is the answer. He preached it Sunday night. The altar is the answer. You have, you have experienced firsthand the fivefold ministry from the pastor, from the evangelist, and from the prophet. What God said he's going to do in this church in Zanesville to reach nations and other states and other cities. And I just want to know, is there anybody willing to go to the altars? Anybody willing to pay the price? Is there anybody willing to conform to the image of God to present your body a living sacrifice? A living sacrifice. He's going to bless you. He's going to multiply you. But it's not going to happen doing the things the way you've been doing them. Following the traditions of your fathers instead of following the traditions and the word of the Lord. Is there anybody who says, I'm willing to break the yoke of the past to embrace the prophecy and the promise of the future? Somebody shout amen. Amen, amen. amen. Do you feel it? You want to feel anything you do? Kelly, you exactly what happened. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm coming to the altar. We're not going to take the altar out of this church. We take the altar. We take the fire out. We take the altar out. We take the will of God out. 
Now, when you get here, I want you to cry out to God. Get past the flesh. I want you to lift your voice and literally cry out to God, like coming out of agony, like a death sound. My, my flesh doesn't want to do it. That's why you need to do it. Cry, cry aloud to God right now. Cry aloud to God right now. The Word of the Lord is at the altar. The will of God is at the altar. You know, I know we do this a lot, and, I, and I, I don't want to just trivialize it, but I want you to hear me. I think it's important. I know you're down here praying individually, and I know that the word of the Lord was to some individuals, but what I felt very strong about it was more to the entire body. God will speak to some of you down here individually, but I think more directly it was to this body. It was a, apparently a confirmation to what in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established. So God's calling us to die out collectively as a body. We're going to die out and let the will of God be done. And God will direct us and God will project us to our destinies and where the destiny of this church is. God's already got that destiny set. I don't get to decide it. Staff doesn't get to decide it. It's, it's already been predestined. God knows where this church is supposed to go to. We need to get on that path. And follow that path and go down it. So here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to join together at this altar today as a family. This altar. God showed me something here a while back about uh, when Elijah, and I'll talk about this tonight. When Elijah built that altar, 12 stones, which means he was bringing them back from being a divided kingdom to bring them back to being the family of God. 12 tribes is the family of God. And so we're going to come up here today as a family. Collectively, we're going to come up here. Does that make sense? And we're going to pray together, and we're going to cry out to God together. And when we do, I just feel very strong that something will be released. When this church sends a signal to God, we want to do your will. Above everything else, and I think that's what we're in this altar for. Is that correct? We as a congregation want to do the will of God. Whew. Can I see it? That's, 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 that's what I want. A part, as a part of this family and as a part of this body, I want to do the will of God. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If it's okay, I'm going to ask you to join. It's, just connect as, as many as you can. Just one big connection through here. And then I want you to just, just, just lift your hand and begin to cry out to God. I want you to send us in. We want the throne of God. We want the authority of God. We want the, let the will of the Lord's prayer, let your will be done in us, even as it is in heaven. We want a throne of righteousness to rule and to reign in this congregation. There you go. There you go. There you go. There it is. There it is. Una la la ya kosha. Ya tala na mokota ya la hasha. Ikatara na mora ya la 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 kataya. Shondore la. Ye tala la la ma hasha tala la ma.
Come on, everybody. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I went all over this altar, all over the room right now, begin to pray in the Spirit. I want you to begin to pray in the Spirit. The Lord is bringing revelation to your spirit. Come on, send that up. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. feel the fire coming down from heaven up on your altar right now. I can feel the fire of the Lord coming down from heaven up on your altar right now. They weren't only praying in the spirit. There was cloven tongues like as a fire that set up on every one of them. Thank you for what we feel. Thank you for what you're doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, some of you, you've broken the curse that's been in your life and you've entered into this place of blessing. I think you ought to begin to rejoice all over this room for the blessed life that God has given you. Come on, begin to lift your spirit and rejoice in right now. We thank you for the promises of blessing in our future. We thank you for the blessing, oh God, that's upon us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I want you to rejoice as the blessed people of God. Ooh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Of Jesus. How many can feel the hand of the Lord upon us today? How many can feel that? All of you are arrows, arrows to be sent to the will and the destiny of God. Come on, there's a spirit of unity that is set upon you right now. I want you to lift your hands to the Lord and ask God right now, Lord, baptize me with a love for your body. Baptize me with a love for your people. Baptize me with a love for the church. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come here, Sawyer. Begin to pray with this congregation of people. Begin to pray what you feel. Pray from your heart. <laughs> God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for these people of the church. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help them, Lord, as we go through this season of blessing. <laughs> Lord, help us. Help my get at this in these arrows. Help them just to send us in the east, south, east, west, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray for every single soul in this body that Come will on. be arrows according to you, Lord Jesus, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, I pray for every people in here, Lord, that you would help them to be used as arrows, Lord, according to you, Lord, and help us when we go back to our homes and our houses and our schools, Lord, that you would help us to be a minister to everybody there, Lord, help us, Lord Jesus, Lord, help us, help us to be used by you, Lord, and go and turn the names in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Sister Mary Williams, I want you to pray for this, for this body of people right now. Hallelujah. Go ahead, Sister Williams. Begin to pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. <laughs> thank you for every day. I thank you for our good pastor. Thank you for the truth that we have. God, I pray you will continue to bless 
Then, oh Lord, we will find that all. Yeah. And God deserves it in a better way. I love you, Lord. I thank you for every day you have. Yes. I pray it will continue to bless me in this church. Bless our pastor and his family. And I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Come on, receive that prayer of blessing. Would you do that across this room? Hallelujah. Here's what you need to do. You need to make a covenant of vow to God about your prayer and about your altar. We have a prophet with us. He's going to preach again tonight. It's going to be powerful. He says he's going to preach about Elijah. We don't want you to feel pressured with any time. We know that the Lord has sent you. We don't want him to feel pressured at any time. Can I get an amen from this church? We come hungry to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I want you to lift your hands. And the Lord's going to speak to you about sacrifice and prayer time and fasting right now. I want you to lift your hands all over the building. In this church right here in this altar, I want you to let the Lord speak to you about your prayer time. I want you to commit to it. Your day of sacrifice, your day of fasting, I want you to commit to it. Come on. The Lord's going to give you convictions, and I want you to commit to those convictions that you won't override His Spirit, but you will follow His will. Come on, that's it. Lift your voice and tell God, I want to go into your will, not my will. I mean, to drag my flesh to the altar and daily sacrifice, oh God. As Paul said, I die daily. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now your blessing is going to be left up to your response and your act of obedience to the word. I think before we're dismissed, and you can pray here as long as you feel to, but I believe we've got to clap our hands and thank God for a word from the Lord. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. How many believe God's going to do a great thing and is doing a great thing in Zanesville, but he's going to do greater? Do you believe greater things are yet to come? Amen. Is there anything else you feel, Bishop, for today? Until tonight. Let's come back tonight. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Please come back tonight. Amen. If you got plans, change them to be here. Amen. We've got a word from the Lord. Amen. Again tonight. And uh, you can stay and pray. There is a spirit of prayer that's upon you. You know, the altar, the uh, prayer rooms, men, uh, 5 o'clock, men's prayer room, ladies at 5 o'clock. Come early to church to pray. Like he said, build the altar before you worship and get your mind on the Lord so you can just flow and worship. God bless you. You can be dismissed in Jesus' name. You can stay and pray as long as you need to. In the name of Jesus.